and um, answer questions. Ruben. Well, a great set of talks this morning to kick things off. And for my talk, I wanted to pivot a bit and focus a little bit on kind of what comes next, what are some of the gaps, and a bit, a little bit of review in terms of what you've heard as we try to put all of these things together. Now, as John mentioned, I, I, I've moved, and again, have moved as, as interesting opportunities ha have come around, but it also has helped to give me perspective, geographic perspective. So for example, I'm able to really rate barbecue kind of across the country, whether you want to go <laughs> really much more vinegar, you know, North Carolina, much better for, for pork. Uh, but if you want brisket, you got to stay in Texas. You know, if you want Mexican food, you don't go to North Carolina. So, you know, there's both geographic perspective, but there's also field perspective. Because I, I have overseen now for, for many years, really all efforts related to cancer across all specialties and disciplines. But still, I'm very active, obviously, in seeing MPN patients being involved with trials. So I always do kind of compare and contrast, you know, what do we learn from other fields? Uh, where might that be coming in the, in the near future for MPNs? Because uh, across diseases, I think we learn from one another. Indeed, even in the MPN world, many of the discoveries that have had impact in MPNs have had impact in very, various other fields in inflammatory disorders. You might be surprised to know that there is a ruxolitinib cream for dogs that have itching. <laughs> so uh, a lot of these things might have a benefit in a whole range of things from ruxolitinib and JAK inhibitors having impact on rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and, and other pieces. Ruxolitinib was used as a treatment for COVID pneumonia in clinical trials for uh, individuals during the time of COVID. So again, there's a lot of cross-pollination in medicine. Here are my disclosures. I like to say that I, I've danced with everyone. <laughs> so as we try to think a bit more at a 20,000 foot view, you know, I look around this audience and see many wonderful friends and faces that have been here to many conferences and new faces. Realize that, that again, you're a, a very heterogeneous group of individuals of different ages, of different experiences, of different backgrounds of health. And as we think about diseases like MPNs, everything that makes you an individual is important in terms of how we approach your disease. Both how the disease impacts you whether that's risk of blood clots, whether that's symptoms, as you've heard, whether that's uh, high blood counts or low blood counts, whether the spleen is a factor, and of course, your baseline level of health. We can, two individuals that have very different levels of baseline health might have a very different experience with a disease. Now, one of the areas that really, it was Joyce Niblack herself who challenged me early on in my career and said, you know, patients with these diseases are suffering. They're having difficult symptoms that largely are being, you know, either discredited or ignored by their providers because they do not externally physically look ill. Uh, oftentimes because they're in practices with cancer patients that have other more advanced or different cancers, pancreatic cancer, advanced ovarian cancer. And, and yes, they may look healthier than those other individuals. She like, and she said this, and it was very appropriate, that really is neither here nor there. You know, it, it's not a race, and it's not to say that you are necessarily more ill or less ill than someone that has a completely different disease. But what was important was, again, how do we quantify what people are going through, and then what do we learn from it? So we've learned quite a bit, as many colleagues in this audience and others have, done work together on this issue of, well, why do people not feel well? Is it the biology of the disease? Is it causing inflammation, difficulties with blood flow? Or is it anxiety? Is it depression? Is it uncertainty related to the future? Or perhaps is it some of both? 
We have learned without question that many of the symptoms patients with MPNs can experience are, a, are tied to the biology of what is going on in your body. Fatigue, by far the most common symptom, and yes, there are many contributors, but it's not made up. It's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, arbitrary. It really is linked with whether it's inflammation, whether it's change in hormones, whether it's low blood counts. And yes, the possibility of the uncertainty of the future having an impact on how you feel, absolutely. Uh, are there individuals with MPNs that have had unrecognized or untreated depression or anxiety? Yes. You know, and these things, again, might be able to be addressed in parallel with the other aspects of biology that can be helpful. Abdominal symptoms from a large spleen, again, can have a range of different implications in terms of biology that are really relevant. Indeed, some of the reasons why we see symptoms improve dramatically or quickly for patients with a JAK inhibitor with enlarged spleens, we still don't even fully quite understand. The, the rapidity of that reduction and the benefit that occurs. Constitutional symptoms such as fevers, night sweats, chills, these again have a whole range of different implications that we're learning more about and you'll hear more about in various talks throughout the conference, whether it be in Dr. Fleischman who looks at nutrition and inflammation, Dr. Gowan that looks at integrative approaches to trying to improve these difficulties. Microvascular symptoms. Again, we talk about blood clots, but there are many things well shy of a blood clot, which is a completely obstructed blood vessel that can occur that can give symptoms with a decrease in blood flow. Now, in medicine and in the world of blood diseases and cancer, we speak of precision medicine, which to some term is a surrogate for saying we, are, we look at the genetic changes in your particular illness. What we're learning is that to be precise about medicine, that's a starting place, but really it's not the end point. You know, I try to use the, the analogy for those that watch Star Trek. Uh, Spock very famously said, logic is the beginning of wisdom, not the end. You know, and I think genomics is the start of precision medicine but it is not the end. We could put the same disease in two different individuals and it's going to behave quite differently. Now, in addition, as we think about genetics, genetics are not only about the genetics of your MPN, they're about the genetics of yourself. You know, we know that there are vast differences how we metabolize drugs. We might give the same drug to two different people, but the amount of that drug that circulates, that's exposed to their body might be quite different as well as a whole range of different genetics of their heart function, of their fitness, uh, of their, their mental or cognitive abilities. All of these things can have significant implications as we truly think about even the genetics involved. Now, in the diseases, you've just heard three wonderful talks from just fabulous colleagues. And, and again, I can't say enough for the colleagues who Again, these are busy individuals come here from all over, take their whole weekend to be here, uh, and really the generosity that they share in terms of the, their, their time. Uh, but they do it because things like this are deeply rewarding for us. It's great to be able to interact with you all, great to hear your stories, and we frequently come away from these meetings really very energized about the importance uh, of of what we're doing and trying to move forward. Now, I titled this talk Gaps and Guidelines. And guidelines, you can think, are a bit of a roadmap that are shared with physicians overall how to treat a disease. Now, there's all the variations in terms of deciding which treatment is best for an individual that I like to call the, the, the art of medicine. There's both science and art. Science is saying, boy, these six different drugs are an option. The art is saying, well, which of these, including the option of not using any of those six at all, and just watching a disease, that is the art of medicine. Now, as we think about ET, or yeah, as we think about ET, we have, again, many gaps. In the middle there 
in a very non-patient friendly sort of layout uh, and you can actually go on to the nccn website and there are these these guidelines somewhat reinterpreted for for patients to be able to read them but what are the gaps at a high level one a key gap we have is who needs treatment if I would tell you that there is probably not universal agreement. Who needs treatment with ET? Is that everyone? Is that people who have symptoms? Is it only people that have over age 60 or have had a blood clot in the past? Now, why do we not know this? Well, in part, because we still don't fully know our goals in terms of both trying to control the disease and to prevent progression. Second, in all of these cases, we say we need to manage cardiovascular risk factors. I would say overall, as a field, we probably do not do this very well. Uh, hematologists probably don't manage cardiovascular risk factors in, in a way as a cardiologist might, and that's, that's a big opportunity. Third, we need more treatments. As you heard from the wonderful talk from Dr. Michaels, we have things in evolution, but that list is pretty short. We need more therapies. Why do we need more therapies? Because you're all different. And we know that the therapies that we have are helpful, but they're still not helpful enough in that uh, we have yet to find a cure or long-term ability to be able to achieve a remission. And then fourth, and this is a critical one across the board, predicting progression. And what is an adequate response? Is it a plate count of 400? Is it a white count under 10? Is it a plate count under 300? For some people, is hitting a plate count of 600 good enough if they started at 2.5 million? And to get them from 600 to 400 introduces additional toxicity. To be honest, we don't have a good answer for that. We don't have trials that really have dissected these fine points. We do the best we can with the art of medicine that we have. We balance, again, how well a medicine is agreeing with you versus how well you've responded. But we still do not have a great blood test or surrogate to say, boy, I'm treating you as an individual with enough intensity for your disease to make a difference. In Pivera, the questions are very, very similar. We're, again, better cardiovascular control, more medicines, and there's more medicines in that pipeline than those with uh, ET. Uh, and then what is a predictor of progression? Indeed, you saw the beautiful data for, from Dr. Silver, and you'll hear from Dr. Kalajan and others who really have made a, a huge impact on our field by helping to outline the, the benefit of interferon, which can be significant. But we still don't have a good way of knowing for certain, even for an individual on interferon, do we have you on enough interferon to help progression of the disease? We still don't know this. It's something, once we do, it might be very helpful. Might we be able to use less? Do we need to use more? Can we give it less frequently or more frequently? Now, in myelofibrosis, as Serge very nicely discussed, we really have had a long story with the JAK inhibitors. The JAK inhibitors have made a big impact. They are a clear step in the right direction. They're not the final step, but they have made an important step and anticipating four JAK inhibitors, that is a very helpful place to be. They're all slightly different. As Serge had discussed, they all have their nuances in terms of who may respond best. And what we don't know is, again, they all may have different benefits in terms of which one is the best to combine with other therapies as we move to more combination approaches. So having several agents is a real benefit. Now in myelofibrosis, again, we have many gaps. One, who needs treatment versus risk? When we started the approval process for, for ruxolitinib that initially was approved for intermediate two and high-risk myelofibrosis, that was all fairly arbitrary to only treat a subset of individuals, and that was a bit of a reflection of when drugs are newly being tested, that you use them in the patients that are the most ill. But there's many different 
uh, bodies of evidence that might suggest if we intervene earlier in the course of the disease, we might have a better longer-term impact. So with all of these different risk scores, you know, I would say that in my practice, I have found that the risk scores are probably more helpful with our post-lunch discussion around transplantation than they have necessarily been around medical therapy. Gap two, I think, is that uh, we still probably underutilize transplant. And then when we do transplant, in many individuals, we probably do it too late. As a non-transplanter, people will say, when is the best time to do transplant? Unfortunately, the answer is probably before you think that you need one. Because transplant as a salvage therapy or as a therapy for a patient who's become very ill is usually not very successful. You know, all of the patients I've had who've gone to transplant over the years, and I've had many and who have, you know, done well with transplant, but they typically were individuals who were proactive and got transplanted before they became really ill with the disease. Gap three, JAK inhibitors are helpful, but how do we optimize and which agent and when? I think we're still slow in that arc. You know, I'll just use the current example. There probably are patients on ruxolitinib today who probably should be on either procuritinib or fedratinib uh, because of how their disease has evolved. You know, and part of that gap is again having people become kind of familiar with drugs as well as sometimes being reluctant to, to change. Four, predicting progression and what is adequate response. Again, is it to have the shrink be uh, unpalpable? Uh, is it to have the blood counts be normal? Uh, do we uh, underdose many of these medicines for arbitrary reasons? And then gap five, how do we do even better? The JAK inhibitors have clearly made a benefit, but they clearly, we still have room to go in terms of the impact for patients who are on them, in terms of how long they benefit patients, in terms of you know, our goal, which is to have your life be as normal as possible, to live out your normal life expectancy, and to have as minimal side effects from a treatment as possible. Now, something that is very good news is, again, we have probably an unprecedented number of clinical trials that are ongoing in myelofibrosis and across MPNs with many drugs that are looking at different ways of going after the disease alone or now frequently in combination with JAK inhibitors that are having an impact. I think in the future, as again, as I think about how we treat most other blood diseases, bone marrow diseases, cancers, we rarely treat them with one single drug. That is really more an exception than the rule for a variety of reasons. All of these diseases are complex and usually are better controlled with more than one drug. Now, there have been really revolutions in terms of therapies developed for other diseases. In other blood diseases and in many solid tumors, we have seen unbelievable impact with agents that work with the immune system. People know the many, many well-known examples. President Carter had metastatic melanoma to the brain and years ago, before the new therapies that were developed, should long ago have passed from his disease. Yet is alive and doing well from that disease because of the tremendous advances in immune-based therapies. Now, these specific drugs have been tried in MPNs and have not been beneficial. But the concept behind why they're beneficial, ramping up the immune system, and having the immune system attack the disease, has great potential. There are many efforts to try to go under at the biology of the disease. I'm part of one of these efforts along with Dr. Mascarenas, Dr. Palmer, you know, a, 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 and many others called the MPN Research Consortium that is supported by the National Cancer Institute, where we're looking at a variety of innovative ways trying to go after that earliest cell in the bone marrow called the stem cell involved with the disease to, again, see if we can get a deeper benefit against the disease. There are agents that are in development, not yet in clinical trials, one that created quite a splash 
this year at the American Society of Hematology was this agent from Insight that looks to target that is on the surface of cells, the abnormal cow reticulin. Now, why this is interesting is that cow reticulin on the cell surface might allow us to target bad cells and not injure good cells. And that's always the challenge we have with many of our therapies. When we give hydroxyurea, for example, a very nonspecific agent, it harms regular cells and bad cells. And we just hope that we harm enough of the bad cells that we could lower the counts, but we're still harming good cells. So it's really the holy grail in our world to try to have therapies that are specific. They showed in animals, so again, not yet proven in patients, hopeful, but not yet there, that again, this may have a benefit, but again, in a specific group of individuals, probably those with a cow reticulin mutation, with MF or ET, and probably trials that will begin with people who have one of those conditions and cow reticulin, but who are not doing well with their current therapy. There are many cellular-based therapies. These are things that we call CAR-T, CAR-NK. These are where we take T cells, an immune-based cell, and we prime them to go after a particular type of disease or cell. Now, these have had a real significant impact in lymphoma, in myeloma, in acute lymphocytic leukemia. Not yet ready for prime time in diseases like MF, but we may get there. Uh, they're being tested as we speak against solid tumors as well. There is CRISPR. CRISPR is a technology to try to correct a change in a gene. And in fact, some of these uh, technologies are having good success in clinical trials in diseases that uh, are non-cancer type diseases. So they're being looked at in sickle cell anemia or in hemophilias where there's a genetic change. And if you fix it in 10% of the cells, the severity of the disease is dramatically less. One of the reasons is probably not yet ready for prime time in, in, in MPNs. First, we may have more than one genetic change to fix. Two, you probably need to correct the genetic change in the majority of cells, if not almost all the cells. Because if not, the cells that are not corrected may grow to replace those that were uh, removed kind of through the process. So I think we will get there. Uh, but that's one of the reasons for those that have followed CRISPR why it has been slower in coming than you might have anticipated. There are complementary approaches, of which Dr. Gowan is an expert and will be speaking a little later. But we've done work looking at meditation as a way to help to improve sleep, decrease inflammation, beneficial in MPNs, and now we're testing it in other cancers. Now we have other gaps. Indeed, we're in a period where we call the cancer moonshot, where the president and the, the federal government has said, well, how can we try to change how cancer impacts us? And certainly think of blood disease like MPNs falling in this same category. We lack effective detection approaches to find them early. Impacts way too many individuals. We have limited success in some of the toughest to treat and rare cancers. Again, very relevant for our discussion here today. We have stark inequities in the diagnosis, treatment, trial access, patient outcomes based on race, region, and resources. So how do we change cancer as we know it? It's going to take a variety of things. Cancer is not going to disappear from the face of the planet. Part of it is a natural process of aging. But the focus is, well, how do we change what it is about cancer that is bad? You know, to make it more controllable, to make it less impactful for those that face it. So again, these things are ongoing, but there may be several benefits that again will have impact for diseases like MPNs, including focuses on precision medicine, focuses on rare cancers, focusing on learning from patients, we clearly have learned that we need to focus on team-based care. Again, as, a, as an MPN patient, you know, you probably benefit from having a dermatologist. 
You know, we know there's an increased risk of skin cancers, and some of the medicines may have implications for that. If you're prone to heart disease, having a good cardiologist is critical. Uh, opth good ophthalmology care, uh, as well as, as other aspects in really supporting your journey. I think we have opportunities in terms of how we communicate globally around the world as a field. You know, as we share data, we historically, many of the things you have seen have been data shared from some sites, some large sites that focus on MPNs, but really not kind of aggregate societal data. We could say, boy, could we just look to see every last ET patient in the U.S. and learn from that experience. We're not there yet. If we were, we might learn quite a bit from that. There are countries that have done this very well, Denmark probably being the, the prime example, but there is power in numbers. We know that we, for MPNs, do not have a good understanding of how MPNs really impact diverse populations. Almost everything we have learned from MPNs has been from Caucasian patients in the U.S. and Northern Europe. That's just the blank reality. We have almost no data as it relates to uh, the developing world or, or individuals from a range of diverse backgrounds. So it's a key opportunity because there's important genetic differences, there's cultural differences, there's other things that are very highly relevant. Indeed, even our clinical trials in MPNs have been shockingly not reflective of the U.S. population. None of this has been intentional on anyone's regard, but you know, how do we really work to have that diversity in trials so that we understand, again, how medications, their safety, their effectiveness, uh, learn more from the disease. We know in certain blood diseases that there's stark inequities that have been very relevant in terms of biology. Multiple myeloma that's dramatically overrepresented in African American patients. Indeed, I had to answer four hours of questions regarding diversity in clinical trials in the U.S. Congress about a year ago. Uh, that was its own kind of grueling experience, uh, but did end up leading to the successful package, passage of the Diverse Act, which are a series of, uh, of bills and regulations really trying to encourage greater diversity on cancer clinical trials. So how do we put all of this together? Well, again, it gets to how do we really develop plans that are specific for you in terms of the genetics of your disease, in terms of, yes, the label of your disease, ETPV or MF, but how the disease is affecting you sometimes is just as important as to what that label looks like. How do we take into consideration your baseline health, your genetics, your viewpoints, all part of how we treat you. So I'd like to conclude by saying that, again, having the perspective of being involved with many fields and many diseases, the MPN community is a very special community. I think the, the bond, I think, between and amongst patients in terms of how you support each other, I think the, the close relationships and passion that investigators that's a sure sign you've gone on too long when you get the uh, <laughs> when you when you get the alarm. But I think it's really allowed a tremendous amount of progress to occur. Uh, it's really helped to advocate, I think, for change. Uh, I think it really has helped to drive again the focus and the development of both new therapies uh, and new discoveries. So with that, I'd like to thank all the wonderful colleagues I have a chance to work with, and then I think we are going to have our panel discussion.